Karelia Museum of Art and History is located on the traditional territory of the Anishinaabeg. The Anishinaabeg include the Ojibwe, Ottawa, and Potawatomi nations, collectively known as the Three Fires Confederacy. We respect and observe the long and enduring presence of Indigenous Peoples, First Nations, Métis, and Inuit on this land. Their teachings and stewardship, culture, and a way of life have shaped our city's unique identity. Hey everyone. Thank you so much for joining us this evening for our April installment of the History Speaker Series. I am the History Programming Coordinator at OMA. My name is Lindsay, and I have our wonderful speaker with us as well, who it is my pleasure to be able to introduce tonight. So we have Judy Humphreys with us. Um, Judy taught high school English in Brockville, Toronto, and Gravenhurst. And after eight years raising children at home, Judy accepted the offer to open a library for the Office of the Fire Marshal at the Ontario Fire College. She spent the next 20 years there as a research librarian before retiring in 2012, and thus began what I love that you termed as your volunteer career, uh, which included work at the Gravenhurst Archives, becoming the head of the archives in 2015. And this spawned Judy's commitment to sharing the stories of World War I soldiers from in and around our area. Um, which I understand you plan to publish at some point, and of course have featured in uh, Judy's very popular talks. Uh, so with that, I'm very pleased to hand it over to Judy Humphreys for her talk. It is June of 1940. And we are standing flabbergasted at the main intersection of a small Ontario town. These are German prisoners of war entering our town somewhere in Ontario, but I am unable to tell you the location of this town. The allied powers have called for complete silence on the location of POWs being held by the allies in Ontario. So let us set the stage for this unusual moment in history and look back into time to see what's brought us to this moment. Britain had to declare war on Germany after the Germans had begun to invade one country after another. The Fuhrer Directive 16 was released on the 16th of July, 1940. And by that directive, uh, the German Wehrmacht was made to know that, in fact, the Operation Sea Lion was a plan for the invasion of Britain. This was not a surprise to the Wehrmacht. In fact, everyone knew that this was at the nucleus of Hitler's plan for the war progress. It was immediately clear that prisoners taken by the Allies would not be able to be left in Britain. Should Hitler's forces invade suddenly, the English Channel and, and the coastline, a ready-made army would be waiting to be released into action in England. And with the increasing storage shortage of food, the British would not be able to feed prisoners of war. On June the 10th, 1940, Canada's War Cabinet agreed to take prisoners of war for internment in Canada. The Canadian government had been searching Canada for vacant places where they could, in fact, create prisoner of war camps. One that became obvious to them was the former Calador Tuberculosis Sanatorium in Gravenhurst, built originally to treat well-to-do TB patients who could afford to pay for their treatment. By 1935, this sanatorium was sitting empty. Immediately, a message was sent to the Canadian government. The first shipment of prisoners would be arriving at Gravenhurst in Ontario in 20 days. The red box on the map shows where these POWs would be headed. That's the place where that prisoner of war camp was going to be located. The message continued to say, please prepare the former TB sanatorium called Calador for its new occupants. So here we are, 
It's June of 1940. We have approximately 20 days in which to convert a former 25-year-old sanatorium into a prisoner of war camp. The Royal Canadian Engineers and about 185 civilian tradesmen have been given the task of transforming this old sanatorium into a functioning camp. In no particular order, they had to deal with quite a few things. They had to either deal with, construct, or repair new water lines, new sewage systems, heating plants, storage for coal and wood, renovation of the main building for officers, erecting a 10-foot-high steel fence with barbed wire topping, guard towers at every corner so that all areas would be covered by two, and then sentry posts on the ground, accommodation for other ranks, kitchens, two of them, with equipment to begin with, beds to be built, administration buildings to be built, accommodations for administration and for the Veterans Guard of Canada who would be living on site. Eventually, they would have to construct classrooms, library, and mess hall. Right from the start, it must have been very clear what a nightmare it was going to be to administer a prisoner of war camp. After all, there were going to be all of these layers of British and Canadian government who would be involved in administering that POW camp, but from a distance. Beyond all those layers of administration imposed from on high, we would finally reach the man in charge, the on-site camp commandant. He was in charge of everything with the leaders of various groups reporting to him. Most important, he would have to apply the rules of the Geneva Convention of 1929. But again, there would be several more groups who would have input to the implementation of those rules and the administration of the camp. The Swiss would be the protecting power, and the Swiss consulate in Canada would be sending consular reps to inspect the camp and note any complaints. The International Committee of the Red Cross would indeed be looking to provide all kinds of communication to the POW families back home. And the YMCA International would be inspecting the operation as well because they would be charged with providing educational, cultural, spiritual kinds of resources to prisoners of war. Veterans Guard of Canada, composed mostly of veterans of the First World War, would take over all guard duties as of 15th of August, 1940. They would be responsible for guarding the camp, preventing escapes, maintaining order and discipline, and of course they would be unarmed. The Veterans Guard came with their own military hierarchy, which almost matched the camp commandant's administrative structure. There would be approximately 200 guards at any given time, assigned at any given time on rotation, which means they would live in the camp for about two months, then they would be sent away for some R&R, &R, and then they would be transferred to a different camp where they would have to start all of their training all over again because every camp would be very different from the next. Here are those veterans guards. It's just one platoon of them, and they're standing at ease beside the motor transport garage. They would live in tents for the first few months of operations until their barracks were built on the property. The enemy combatants had their own layer of military administration. The German POWs had their own camp leader, or Lagenführer, who was the senior German officer in the camp. He too had a staff, which included German officers, who would be placed in charge of various places and areas in the camp, such as the kitchen, the sports activities, the delivery of education, the dissemination of the mail and the parcels. The Lagenführer would receive all complaints and requests, and he would report to the camp commandant, particularly on those problems that he himself could not solve. He had a secret responsibility as well. He sat on the escape committee, which heard all the proposals, weighed the pros and cons of each, and then chose which proposal for escape would go ahead. This man on the left is Lagenführer Lieutenant Colonel Mayteller. You see here a Nazi officer doing his best to look his best, but he's not very successful because, of course, he's lost part of his uniform and the pants actually give it away. On the 30th of June, 1940, 476 enemy combatants arrived by train at Gravenhurst. These POWs would be marched from the station to the camp through the streets of the town. No photographs would be allowed to be taken 
so that no hint of location would be given, creating targets for Nazi sympathizers. Thus, taking photographs would be punishable by imprisonment. All references in the press would be to somewhere in Ontario. The iconic photograph on the right, printed on the front page of the Toronto Star the very next day, would carry no byline and no location. The young guards that you see marching along beside these Nazi um, prisoners of war would soon be heading off to the front themselves, and they would be replaced by the veterans guard. Looking as arrogant and as superior as they possibly could, the German officers and other ranks were marched through the streets of Cham, and everywhere people stood along the street. They were either silent or they were hissing. How many of them had loved ones in the war in Europe? How they must have hated the sight of these German soldiers marching through their own town? And how many of them would have been frightened for themselves and for their children at the prospect of what might be going to come from having 400 Germans in their midst. This then was the destination for these soldiers marching through town. This is Camp Calador. The area marked in red was the enclosure, the area that encompassed the POWs themselves. The rest of the camp, the entire camp, was called the compound. Guard towers and sentry posts are marked all around the enclosure and around the compound. You can see the shape of the original Calador building, but now only one of the many buildings on the property. Lawrence Street would be, would be the entrance to the camp, and it would be the way in which the prisoners would reach the camp from the train. The barrier around the swimming area went right to the bottom of the lake. It was made of chain link and was attached to the rocks below. Prisoners would swim in groups of about 30. People from the town and from resorts would be out in canoes and boats and might come too close to the fence. If they did so, they would experience perhaps a warning shot across their bow and a loud voice coming over a speaker saying, you are too close to the prisoner of war camp. You can see the actual building that was one of the main buildings of the prisoner of war camp in the background. On the 15th of October, 1941, Camp C became a very different place. Instead of being Camp Calador, it would be called Camp 20, and it would become a Nazi officer's camp. All of the prisoners of war would be high-ranking, mostly committed Nazi officers, with a few other ranks who would serve them. They would be chefs, cooks, cleaners, and tailors. Of course, they also needed a few men who might be needed to do some digging in the future. These other ranks would also work at various tasks around the camp and would be paid for that at an hourly rate of about 20 cents an hour. But officers were the elite of the German military machine. Most were well-educated. Most of them came from well-to-do families. And by 1942, most of the new arrivals would actually come from Rommel's Africa Corps. These officers could not be made to work. The POWs also came complete with every skill imaginable. And you can see from the list here how self-sufficient they could be because they had everything they could possibly need virtually to create a town, but actually to concoct escape plans. They also ate better than their, German, or their, than their Canadian hosts because they had chefs and chefs could turn the most meager of supplies and resources into a feast fit for kings. The photograph of these officers would have been taken by Henry Fry, a Gravenhurst photographer who had the contract with the government to photograph POWs in groups of 10 to make postcards of those photographs and then provide them both to the prisoners and to the International Red Cross to be sent to families back home with a sort of an I'm okay mom message. We have dozens of these photographs in the archives. These are early days and they're all looking a little bit ragtag at the moment. 
but there would soon become a much more stringent application of the rules around dress. Officers would be expected to be in uniform if one was available to them. And actually, uniforms were provided by the Germans for a while by mail to the camp. For those who were not, in fact, officers or who did not have an, a uniform, there would be a regulation camp uniform to be worn. Blue denim shirt, blue denim jacket, and blue jeans, all with amendments. The amendments looked like this. Material was cut from the center back of the shirt, and a red disc was show, sewn in. Pant legs were also suitably altered. The photograph that you see on the right shows prisoners skating in an area seemingly outside the bounds of the compound. In fact, they're just below a home. How could this possibly happen? To understand this freedom, we must look to a privilege called parole, but not exactly the same sort of parole as in today's prison system. Parole in a POW officer's camp was based on the age old concepts of chivalry. An officer is a gentleman. A gentleman's word is his bond. Thus in a POW camp, an officer could give his word as a gentleman not to try to escape during an activity in one of several ways. He could sign a book promising not to escape. He could promise verbally with a witness or he could hand in his block of wood, which contained his signature, thereby giving his promise not to try to escape during this particular activity. Once returned, he would either cross out his name, report in verbally, or pick up his block of wood, and then all bets were off. Officers did not require a guard to go with them off the property, but often took an off-duty guard as a guide since there were areas that were off limits. It took some getting used to for Gravenhurst townspeople to get used to seeing Nazis in uniform in their town. Under Article 17 of the Geneva Convention of 1929, the administration of a POW camp was required to encourage as much as possible intellectual and sporting pursuits among prisoners of war. Thus, a library was opened, which became better stocked every month. Look at that list of books on the left. The envy of any library anywhere outside of a large city. And music, so close to the German soul, was encouraged as well. The POWs formed ever more enthusiastic groups of musicians. There was a chamber music ensemble. There was a jazz band, a dance band a symphony orchestra. On pleasant Sunday afternoon, senior German officers would sit on the lawn listening to chamber music while drinking tea served by the lower ranks. These musical groups would have been the envy of any place. Besides the intellectual and the musical pursuits, there were other pursuits as well. You may be surprised to learn by far the most popular pursuit or activity at camp was studying, taking courses that would better their future lives or at least would keep their minds active. There were schools and libraries in every prisoner of war camp in Canada, but ours in Gravenhurst was by far the most active because these were largely officers used to improving and educating their minds. By July of 1941, 440 of the 476 POWs had enrolled in classes. Courses were taught by experts among their own men, and there were many of those, or they were taken by correspondence from the University of Toronto. A roving U of T prof visited the camp periodically to assist with any questions that they might have. And you can see on the right-hand side, some of the courses that they could take and did take, in fact, it took philosophy, philology, various languages, a number of them, including Russian. <laughs> they studied the theory of music, mathematics, science, agriculture, everything possible for the day when, of course, Germany would be victorious and they would have a career to return to. Life in camp required a delicate balance to be struck. 
Officers could not be forced to work, but they could volunteer to do so. Thus, a landscape designer volunteered to draw up plans to beautify Gall Lake with stone retaining walls, stone steps, and even a stone wharf built out into the lake with a small lighthouse at the end. With some modifications, these designs were accepted by town council and the prisoners built the structures themselves, some of which still exist today. Other ranks could be made to work and most were happy to be kept busy. Officers could decide to engage only in sports or only in recreational activities, or they could choose a combination of study and sports. And there were so many sports. There were indoor sports and games like ping pong and bridge and chess, checkers and cards for foul weather. There was tennis, volleyball, football, which is really soccer, hockey, and so on. First, the ten later on, the tennis court would, and later on, a field would be flooded in winter for skating and hockey. Teams were formed. Equipment was purchased, and you can see some of the hockey players before you there. They actually had those regulation hockey socks. They have some pretty good-looking skates, excellent sticks, and so on. That field that they purchased in 1943 as a sports field became the center of activity in all seasons. And of course, in summer, there was swimming and canoeing. But there was even more to enhance the long days of imprisonment. There were pets. Pets do make a camp more homey. And as you can see here, there were several Scotty dogs in camp. Some of the pets also increased in numbers and made valuable contributions to dinner. The inter-camp inter grapevine soon revealed the extent to which there were pets, pets in Camp 20. At one camp, they had a number of pets, probably not to be imagined. First, the prisoners of war built a fish tank and caught fish in the hot rock to stock it. Then they built cages for several types of animals. And finally, one government report suggested that some POD, some POW camp in Canada even had a menagerie with a bear cub, two monkeys, dogs, cats, rabbits, and a small snake. Where did all this stuff come from? The broad general answer to that is from all sorts of sources. The Canadian government was responsible for the service pay of German officers. And so they were to be paid an equivalent rate from the detaining country or the lower rate in Germany, whichever was the lowest. In fact, German pay was lower. Thus, a lieutenant would receive $21.26 per month. Other officers then proportionately higher up the scale. Other ranks were paid by Germany itself directly, and a private received $6 per month, although that was all cut off in 1944. Article 24 of the Geneva Convention stated that no prisoner is allowed to hold cash in his possession. So all earnings were deposited into one account. Credits were issued to use at the canteen or from suppliers, and about $1,000 was withheld by the administration of the camp to cover any willful damage that would be done by the POWs. POWs could also receive gifts from family, gifts from sympathetic Americans. But money was also deposited in the central account, for any money that came in. Most items, though, really came from the War Prisoners Relief Fund of the YMCA. Now, keep in mind that we're talking about an officer's camp here. But let's go and take a look at what a regular POW in a regular POW camp might be able to do. In most regular camps, this is what a $21.60 monthly salary would allow you to buy, or in the case of the other ranks, $6 a month. You could get fruit and veg, a few of them seasonable. You could get clothing. I guess that would really amount more to like socks and underwear and pajamas. Writing and reading materials, some soft drinks, some cigarettes, some toiletries. They could even buy some beer by 1942. Certain items were rationed or restricted depending upon shortages. 
By 1943, the weekly allotment in a regular POW camp would be very little a chocolate bar, a few soft drinks, um, one quart of beer. The annual allotment for uh, prisoners of war in a regular camp, one pair of slippers for every three prisoners. Interesting to try to figure that one out. Um, no woodworking tools, no skin lotions, no hair tonic. What was the reality in Camp 20, an officer's camp? The camp commandant could veto any item listed, but generally the log and Fuhrer would sign the request and then the camp commandant would countersign it and then it would go, go off to administration to be ordered through HQ. If problems had sprung up in any way in relations between the POWs and their guards, a little leeway in ordering could sometimes smooth things over. An extra bar of soap, a new shirt, a little more beer, all went a long way to preserving camp peace. In 1940, the request started out pretty simply. There were some playing cards that they wanted, some Bibles, some more German books. From there, it was just a small leap to a gramophone and some records. But then they would also like a piano and some sheet music. By 1941, they would like to have some hockey skates, sticks, pucks, volleyballs, ping pong tables, footballs, boxing gloves, more musical instruments. By 1942, they had movies every week, German movies once a month and costumes, makeup, lighting, and curtains to stage theatrical performances for each other. By July of 1943, POW officers had discovered the Simpsons and Eaton's catalogs, and the splurge was on. Look at what they ordered. <laughs> 299 pairs of shoes, that's bordering on one pair for everybody. They ordered fruit, they ordered razor blades, they ordered lots of tobacco, cases of soft drinks, on and on. Until a directive came down from the Department of National Defense, curb the orgy of spending at Camp 20. Canteen purchases should not exceed $5,000 per month for the whole camp. However, the next order from Eaton's brought another directive because sales for that month had totaled $8,321.99. And that directive said, remove all catalogs and do not replace. Look what they ordered that time. Look what they were spending for laundry because they were actually sending some of their laundry out because the people in the lower ranks in the camp just didn't get that start quite right in the shirt. In 1943, beer consumption, average one gallon per POW per month. Despite the lavish spending habits, the group bank balance really grew. But you might be quite surprised to learn that the one constant on every request list, month after month after month, from the prisoners through the log and fear was more classroom space. They wanted to be able to take more and more courses they wanted to be able to run sections because there were too many people signed up for each section. When it was determined that the open balconies could be closed in and the basement space could be converted with partitions and tables and chairs, the German officers built all of that themselves and they paid for the building materials themselves. And then they decided, wouldn't it be interesting to lease a farm? This was truly the piece de resistance, I think, a farm. Following a fire that had destroyed an old farmhouse on acreage nearby, the government and the POWs were able to lease land to start a farm. POWs gave their word, parole, in return for the right to walk to the farm, where they built a log house, a small barn with stables, a piggery, and a large hen house. They would eventually have three horses, 28 pigs, 400 hens, and some sheep. They studied the local climate and the soil conditions and began an enormous garden. The man that you see on the left is standing there with Caesar and Hannibal, the two horses, and the dog Blackie. This is Lieutenant Colonel Westerfeld, and he was obviously not afraid of work. 
If you look at the picture at the bottom right, you see that he is plowing in the very old manner of plowing with his horses. In the photo on the right, you can also see that there are about 30, well, that's some members of the 30 member work team with, it, with the framework of the log cabin that they were working on building. And that's the massive garden. The meat and vegetables produced on the farm supplemented the food rations for the POWs. And this turned out to be a particularly helpful thing because near the end of the war, when food supplies were becoming more limited, food, of course, was going to have to go farther, but not for these folks. They had a garden second to none with all kinds of meat as well. So far, it all sounds rather idyllic. No wonder the townspeople referred to this as the Nazi resort. Why would anyone want to escape? Psychologists studying the effects of POW incarceration after the war produced a number of interesting papers. Their research suggests that although there was no duty to try to escape, in fact, most POWs, whether they be German or ours, believed that that duty existed, even if it wasn't written down anywhere. We've also learned that, in fact, only about 20% of POWs, theirs and ours, really wanted to try to escape. And think about that for our POWs held in Germany. In Europe, our soldiers had begun to learn just how bad the conditions in war-torn Europe really were. Where would they try to go? And very few of them spoke other languages to help them on the way. In Canada, for German POWs, the long months of winter conditions and the long distances from place to place made the thoughts of escape rather difficult. Getting to the U.S. was the goal, particularly since the U.S. didn't join the war until much later. Escape attempts were frequent in every camp in Canada, but only one POW made it back to Germany, and he was not from Gravenhurst. And there's an irony in his escape because he made it back to Germany and died only about three months later when the uh, plane he was flying um, was shot down. There were several methods of escape tried out in our prisoner of war camp in Gravenhurst. On the 20th of August, for example, in 1940, so we're talking about very, very quickly after the camp opened, Werner Koch decided to escape. POWs had been digging a tunnel ever since they had arrived. For almost two months at this point, they were planning a mass escape of over 100 men. But this nice man decided to go it alone and blow all that work and all those hopes and dreams of, of all of those prisoners who'd been digging. He went it alone out the tunnel. He hitchhiked to Toronto saying to people who picked him up that he was a Norwegian, although we hadn't actually opened Little Norway at that point. He was actually given money by one or two of the people who picked him up. He continued hitchhiking to Montreal, but his luck, luck stopped there. A very alert veterans guard sentry stopped him at the end of a bridge to check for his papers and immediately arrested him and called the police. He was back in camp about three days later and spent the next 28 days in the guardhouse. Escape by vehicle. On August the 30th, 1940, a scant 10 days after that prior escape, in a camp still under construction, two men managed to jam a board under each of two trucks being filled with rubble and rock. They crawled in underneath the truck and rode through the gates to freedom. One was picked up as he hitchhiked to North Bay. Interestingly enough, he was picked up by a Toronto Star reporter who had been sent north to cover the story of escaping prisoners from Camp 20. The other made it over to Bala, where he enjoyed a cup of tea in a home with a, an older lady living there before being picked up by the uh, um, guards that she had called for. All in all, they experienced 12 hours of freedom and 28 days in the guardhouse. And under the Geneva Conventions, no further reprisals were allowed. Escape by packing case. Dr. Cray had a strong motive for wanting to get home. He'd married his bride by proxy while he was in the POW camp. 
With some distractions staged by some of his friends, he managed to climb into a packing crate. He was loaded onto a truck and then loaded onto a baggage car. He was unloaded on the platform in Toronto and he pushed up the lid to climb out and was caught immediately. 18 hours of freedom, 28 days in the gardens. How about escape by mattress cover? With water, water everywhere, why not try water as a means of escape? Two men removed the brown mattress covers from their beds and took them folded inside their towels down to swim. A little distraction was staged and they were in the water with that brown material underneath them. Slip inside the mattress cover under the water, slide along and use a slim metal tube for air. Cozy up to the rocks along the shore and you look just like another pair of rocks. The two remain submerged at the shoreline. However, the counter swimmers quickly revealed their absence and with some quick shore work, they were quickly discovered. Where had they hoped to go? They were still inside the boundary of the camp. On the 8th of December, 1942, Seven POWs escape by tunneling through the snow. You know how deep the snow gets here. In pillowcases and bed sheets during a blinding snowstorm. Two were found in a nearby gully. One got to Washego. One got to Stroud. I'm not sure how that happened. And two were found on a snowplow in Barrie. But no, no, not riding in the cab of the snowplow. No, these guys were clinging to the snowplow on the front of a train. Can you imagine how absolutely frozen they probably were? For these six, it was 28 days in the guardhouse. But what about the seventh man? Siegfried Schmidt remained missing for four months. Where on earth had he been? Well, he undertook some personal plastic surgery by lancing the inside of his cheeks and filling them with some sort of stuffing to change his appearance. While waiting for all of that to grow in, he also changed his hairline, his eyebrows, and so on. And where had he done all of this? Why, in the attic and crawl spaces of one section of the officer's quarters. When he was finally found, he was not in very good shape. His health had deteriorated rather dramatically. He was sent to another camp. And then there was one who got away completely, although not back to Germany. Walter Manhart was the only man who got away completely from Camp 20, although he had actually never actually reached Camp 20 to start with. While traveling, I think, from Bowmanville to Gravenhurst by train to take up residence in our camp, he escaped the train and made his way to the United States. Despite the note on the description that was sent out, his English was, in fact, not some English. His English was excellent. Americans aided him to get to safety in New York State. He began to teach there, met a woman there, fell in love, and married her. He was not found out until after the war was over when he himself revealed his identity. He visited Camp 20 in 1991 to see what he had missed. As it became clearer and clearer that the Allies were going to win this war in Europe, clear to us, maybe not clear to the prisoners of war, attempts were made to categorize prisoners of war in Canada, both for purposes of indoctrinization and here for or organizing repatriation when it would come. They were identified by the intensity of their Nazi beliefs. The black category of, of prisoner meant hardline Nazi. The gray category meant loyal to Hitler, loyal to Germany, but not fanatical. And a white categorization meant loyal to Germany, but not a Nazi, and probably had been conscripted. Those who were judged to be moderate or white or even gray were often victimized by hardline Nazis in Canadian um, POW camps. In Medicine Hat, for example, two were actually murdered by hardline Nazis for their weakness. 
Many of the POWs who were moderates requested transfers away from hardliners, leaving all the, one, all the rotten apples in one basket, so to speak. Hardline Nazis began to be moved to one central location, and that was Camp 20, where they could not prey on moderates any longer. Camp 20 became a black camp, or hardline Nazi camp, and things became much, much more difficult in that camp for everyone. As the war in Europe came to an end in April and May of 1945, it became clear that a mass repatriation of soldiers, prisoners of war, and refugees would have to take place across Europe and North America. Logistics would be a nightmare, especially in countries that had been reduced to rubble. In Canada, who should go first? First, Allied soldiers would come home and be transported across the country or to the uh, Pacific theater of war if they had not spent enough time in war so far. Refugees would be repatriated to their new homes. Internees would be released and transported to their previous locations. And German POWs would be last. And when they left, they would not be going home. Meantime, more and more hardliners were being sent to Gravenhurst. More moderate German POWs from Canada would be sent to England, not to Germany, to help with the massive reconstruction work and with farm work in England. The English people were starving, as were the Dutch, and all over Europe, harvesting food and cleaning up rubble were priorities. 6,000 POWs asked to stay in Canada, but permission was denied. They had to go home and eventually get back to Germany and reapply to come to live in Canada from Germany. Finally, even the hardliners were shipped out from Gravenhurst to England. Camp 20 finally closed its gates on the 29th of June, 1946, six years less a day from the day that it had opened. In the end, what was the legacy of Camp 20? Well, first of all, the government would sell off the property that it had purchased and all the equipment that had been purchased. The farm had been leased, so that reverted to its original owners. The camp property first became a hotel owned by the British Leyland Corporation, but it failed in one year. And then the most wonderful irony of all, three Toronto businessmen bought the Calador property. They did $100,000 worth of renovations. They produced one of the most popular resorts in Muskoka, and there was a ready-made clientele. For this would be a Jewish vacationer's resort. I love this. For all those people who had been barred from other Muskoka resorts because of their race. The entertainment would be top notch. The dance bands would be wonderful. And people would come from all over, including from all kinds of other resorts, to dine and dance at the Gateway Hotel. Connections of those three Toronto businessmen to the entertainment scene in Toronto brought in great entertainers and great orchestras. Mo Kaufman, Dave Broadfoot, and many others moved up the entertainment ladder by playing here. The scene on the lawn that you see there of a volleyball game played by hotel guests has striking similarities, irony of irony, to photos of POWs in that very same spot playing tennis. And at the Gateway Hotel, everyone was welcome, not just Jewish vacationers. Archie Moore came and trained there, the center of attention in the town for two weeks as he was training for a heavyweight fight. Irony of irony. Former Nazi prisoners brought their families to uh, Camp 20, now the gateway, to see where they had been. The woman standing in the foreground with the little boy in the chair are the wife and son of a formy, former Nazi prisoner of war, Werner Hirschman. Some former POWs met up here on tours from Germany in the mid-1950s, but the property was old and Jewish vacationers wanted to be accepted at mainstream hotels, not just at resorts that were segregated for them. So integration gradually began to happen, largely because the resorts were shamed into it. 
The land would be sold by Irving Ungerman, one of those three businessmen for development. But a strip of land along the lakeshore would be preserved as a park for the people of Gravenhurst. A series of building demolition, demolition sorry, and fires meant that much of the old empty camp was soon gone. Eventually, most of those remnants would be removed as well, as people feared lawsuits uh, from people who were hiking on the property and might fall over cement foundations. In its place, a subdivision would come to life. And now, today, kids swim from May 24th to Thanksgiving at the rocks, and people stroll, stop to enjoy the views of Lake Muskoka, or picnic on the grounds of the old prisoner of war camp. This rocky outcrop was once part of the camp. Once a Union Jack fluttered from a flagpole right there. And if you can see the two steamships in the distance, uh, at the time of the prisoner of war camp, each time a steamship cruised by, the pianist on board would give the signal, all of the passengers would rise to their feet, and in voices that would carry along long distance, begin to sing, Rural Britannia, There Will Always Be in England, or God Save the Queen. Prisoners of war, when questioned about this, maintained that they never heard them. Burn Street is labeled on the right of that photograph. That was the outside limit of the camp, more or less, of the compound, and it was the street down which pr prisoners of war were marched. Access to the present-day parkland can be found at the foot of Lawrence Street, right at the water. A new generation of visitors uh, stops at the interpretive panel these days at the entrance to the trail of the POW camp. The man in the photo is the son of a former POW at Camp 20. After a year of correspondence with him, he and his daughter came um, to meet us and to see the place where his father had spent almost six years of his life. And he would try to understand the impact of that imprisonment on his father's psyche. Cecil Porter would go, on, would go on to publish a history of the POW camp in 1993. And then an updated version after um, 10 years of correspondence with former POWs, etc. cetera, um, he published an updated version of it. The fish tank that had been built by the prisoners was rebuilt at the entrance using the same original stones, but now it's filled with fallen leaves. And this old fire hydrant would be the only lasting remnant of a time when other voices rang out here. And now it too is gone. Judy, thank you so much. That was a fascinating discussion. Um, absolutely incredible to learn that something like that was so close to our own. <laughs> um, so, yeah, as Judy said, if you have any questions at all, please uh, pose them in the Q&A. Um, I did notice we have one already there. Um, Doug tells uh, an interesting story about um, learning about the camp from his grandmother. And he says one of her stories um, that she often mentioned was that there was choral singing that occurred at the camp. And the word was that the singing uh, was used to be uh, as a cover for noises created by. <laughs> um, and he wonders if there's any corroboration of this in the records. Um, I've not read anything specifically to that um, end, but I wouldn't be surprised at all. There wasn't a lot of digging. Um, Gravenhurst is built on two things, on sand in some places and on rock in others. And the camp was built largely on rock. Digging was not a fun occupation because even if you got a start in sand, you were likely to run up against rock before you ever got underneath the, the fence. There wasn't a lot of digging. So as I, you saw the different methods that were used to escape, I think people had had some frustrations with their digging. But yes, the singing actually was also reviewed by a few people who said it was absolutely phenomenal. You know, the sound of it was beautiful. That's great. Thank you uh, to Doug and Vicki for that. 
uh, Deanne asks, um, there must have been resentment toward the officers from the townspeople. Do you know of any attempts to cause trouble with officers due to this? And what was the general relationship between communities and the camps? It's interesting because I think when it started out, you heard me say how resentful they must have been and standing along the side of the street, hissing at them coming down the street. And imagine what it felt like when, when they, hit the, they hit the town the first time. People didn't, well, people who were related to the people who'd worked on the camp, transforming it from a sanatorium to a camp, knew they were coming. But there were all those other people who maybe hadn't had a conversation with anyone and suddenly found themselves on the main street watching a whole group of Nazi soldiers walking by them, many of them in tatters of uniform. It would have been shocking and disheartening and saddening and scary as heck. Um, I think it went from there to being better than that. Um, there was a lot of interaction through the, the, the veterans guards, but also because they had parole, there was a lot of interaction between people, but we didn't have the nasty sorts of things that happened in some camps. Up north at Espanola, there was a camp and there were girls there who <laughs> found some of those POWs who were working in the forests of, of, of Espanola, very, very handsome indeed and all their young men were gone. Um, and so there were little relationships that sprang up and so on. We didn't have much of that here. There was a little bit of it, but very, very little. They just didn't get an opportunity. And on top of that, these were officers. Most of them were too smart to, to sort of get involved or try to get involved with girls. I think generally speaking, by the end of the war, there'd been a sawed off sort of relationship where <sighs> People basically did a let live and let live kind of thing to the point where Gravenhurst High School hosted the track and field competitions for uh, Gravenhurst, Bracebridge and Huntsville at the prisoner of war camp at the farm. Um, they actually made an application to the, um, the camp commandant who would have to go to the log and fear and so on. But generally speaking, yeah, they, they actually held their, their track and field meet there. Um, there wasn't as much fear. There was a lot of fascination. Young boys particularly found the whole thing just fascinating. Couldn't wait to get a hold of, of things. Um, they, they made a lot of things that they sold to people in the town. They, they made um, chips and bottles to some degree, but mostly they were more like... Um, those were the, the guys who were from the, the Navy. Um, but mostly they made um, oh little little things that they could make out of scraps of wood and people bought them and and, uh, and cherished them, I think, because they were handmade and very nicely done. Some artwork, beautiful artwork from some of them. Yeah. Great. We actually have a bunch of questions coming in here. Um, so many, I don't think we're going to get to all of them. <laughs> I'll, I'll yeah. Select a, a few here. Um, Sheila asks, how many of these POW camps were in Canada? 27. Perfect. There were 27 right across the country. Some were huge. The ones out in Alberta were enormous. They had like more than more than 2,000, you know, multiple people. And that's where some of those murders took place because they had all the ranks in one camp. And that didn't work out well at all. We were lucky in a sense that we had just officers here. Um, and actually a clarifying point from Tom, do you know how many were in Ontario specifically? I think there were 10 in Ontario. Um, there was one in Bowmanville, uh, which was became sort of infamous, famous, infamous. There were riots there. Um, and then there were a bunch in Northern Ontario where they could do um, logging and that sort of thing. So there were, they were, some of them were placed strategically to sort of help get some work done. And then there were others that were, and some of them were very short lived, like they would be open for two or three years. That was it. Yeah. Ours was one of the few that was six years. Okay. Um, we have uh, Janet asking, are there records of civilian staff who worked at the camp? And if so, where would they be located? No. Generally speaking, there were no civilians. I mean, there were civilians who worked to set up the camp, trans transform it from um, the um, sanatorium. But once it was actually operating as a prisoner of war camp, no. Generally speaking, there were no civilians. There were deliveries made. 
by civilians to the camp, but everybody in the camp was either a member of the Veterans Guard or a member of the um, Canadian military or the German military. They were, they were all military people. Okay. Um, I'm going to take uh, two more here. Um, we have one question asking, can you provide any detail about the two POWs who died at Camp 20? Do you know anything about that? Yeah, one of them actually didn't die at Camp 20, but was brought here for burial initially. Uh, there were two of them. Um, I have a slide, actually. Uh, one of the prisoners made the most beautiful, oh, maybe 10-foot tall, um, wooden structures that were marking the graves. They were absolutely beautiful. One of them died in surgery in Toronto. He was the guy from this camp here, I believe. He died under surgery. I, I don't know whether he had an, a, an ulcer or appendicitis or what it was, but he had surgery and he died. And the other fellow was died of sickness and was brought here at, from one of the camps to be buried because we had a space at the back of our big cemetery here, Mickle Cemetery. About 1970, all prisoners of war who had died in Canada, who were Germans, uh, were taken to Kitchener, and they were all buried in one graveyard in Kitchener, um, in one area of that graveyard. So they're all buried there now. And those two big wooden monuments were moved to Kitchener as well. Okay. And uh, that actually answers William's question as well, I believe. So that's great. Um, and the last question from Caitlin. The remains of the camp, were they bulldozed into the water? No. Um, the remains of the camp, by and large, well, not that I know of. I mean, they, they could have been, I suppose. But there were, there were weird kinds of remains, if you like. There were a bunch of fires out there. Once the camp was closed and, and, and the hotel had closed and everything else had closed there, um, you had these big empty buildings. And of course, you had, you had sometimes you had people who came along and tried to sort of sleep there. You know, they were wandering around. And so there were fires set that way. Kids set fires there and so on. So the rubble and whatnot would be taken and whatever was done with rubble in those days would be done with the rubble. I don't imagine that they plowed it in. I think it would have been difficult to do that from where the buildings were by, you know, connection to the to the edge of the lake. I can certainly try to find that out, but I, I don't think so. I think it was just all hauled away, you know, gradually over time. Fascinating. Um, on top of the questions, Judy, we had a number of comments thanking you for your, your time and your expertise this evening. Mm -hmm.